o microphone, Maria. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Here I am speaking from Sao Paulo, Brazil, to the organizers of this Congress, to the speakers present in this panel, and to you participants from many countries. I wish you all an agreeable and beneficial use of our time together and a most enriching exchange. This is the third World Congress 11th week of activities. We gather here today to talk about trends as embodiment of being, a theme of enormous relevance to an effective exercise of transdisciplinarity. The gap between logic and being has been a major concern in trans research and studies, publications, formative processes since its foundation in 1998. Today, trends as embodiment of being will be approached beginning with renowned studies in the field of neuroscience, principles of transdisciplinary logic, and contemplative, reflexive, and experiential practice. Coming Friday, issues related to humanology, educational futures, art, the science of being will constellate in, in, in an instigating set of realities where knowledge and being practices are equally valued, nurtured, and unified for human existence to thrive creatively. To address a subject matter of relevance requires a lot of rigor and openness, as well as adequate contextualization. For today's presentation, a selection was made that intends to provide an understanding of the amplitude of this complexity, how challenged it is in actualizing practice. I leave here my gratitude to the speakers and respondents physically present in this panel and to those who due to time zone differences had to record their presentations. I now pass the floor to Susanna Hayes, this week's moderator, who will introduce each of our speakers. I thank her immensely for the careful and judicious work in articulating the week's session theme, in addition to her selection of speakers of today's conference and round table, as well as a symposium group that will speak on Friday, February 5th to which you are all invited. Enjoy it and uh, let's keep going. Susanna, it's, the room is all yours. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Maria, very much. And I will go right to our program. Um, Today, um, we are beginning with the experiential portion of the embodiment of being. My name is Susanna Hayes. I am an artist and educator based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I received my MFA at the San Francisco Art Institute and my doctorate at the University of California at Berkeley. I want to thank the Congress leadership, Siret, Basarab Nicolesco, and Florent Pasqua, C-Trans of Brazil, 
Maria and Victoria, UNESCO, Paolo Orfis, and Juliet Hadar in Mexico City. I'd also like to thank the Entropy, Entropy Institute in San Francisco for their tremendous support for this particular two-day two conference. Our keynote address will be given by Dr. Stephen W. Porges, followed by our roundtable discussion with Dr. Joseph Aziz and Dr. Joseph E. Brenner, the two Josephs. And we will have uh, invited respondents, Jack Kane, Margarita de Vivero Zuber, and Edward Stack following each of their presentations. This equation, trans equals embodiment of being, is something that I conceived of to help us understand the gap and the need for balance between logic and being. We've reached a point, I feel that we can all agree that the transdisciplinary education can no longer afford to teach principles of biology and philosophy without teaching inner engagement practices for directly experiencing feedback loop systems. Logic and being requires reciprocity. Humanity's work is to innerly attend to the evolutionary field of experiencing our existence where perception of mind and body become one action of bi-directional reciprocity. This inner medium of resistance pressures the field of our disparate duality, providing the conditions in which a hidden third force can emerge. Since human evolution naturally agrees with phylogenetic principles, we can ask in the 21st century, how is the transdisciplinary movement assisting an explicit pathway toward revising curricula that engages the principles of science with intuitive contemplative practices? Why do our dual mental, physical, brain, body ways of knowing reject the potential of our hidden third potential? How can education assist our disparate ways of knowing? Each speaker has been invited to bring their understanding of either side of the equation so that we as transdisciplinary educators may more responsibly transmit to humanity the process work of our becoming transdisciplinary beings. Dr. Stephen Porges, our first speaker is a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University and founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. President of a Society for Psycho Psychophysiological Research and, and the Federations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, he has authored numerous articles and lectured extensively about the implications of modern science. In 1994, Dr. Partridge proposed the polyvagal theory, a theory that links the evolution of the mammalian autonomic nervous system to social behavior and emphasizes the importance of physiological state in the expression of behavioral problems and psychiatric disorders. He is the author of the polyvagal theory, the pocket guide to polyvagal theory, and clinical applications of the polyvagal theory. He is also the creator of a music-based intervention, the Safe and Sound Protocol, which is used widely among therapists to improve spontaneous social engagement, reduce hearing sensitivities, assist language processing, and state regulation. In recent years, 
the polyvagal perspective has spread beyond the field of trauma to other disciplines. We as a society are in the process of realizing we communicate through our nervous systems as much as our intellects. Dr. Porges's talk is titled, A Transdisciplinary Theory of Sociality. And it reminds us humans evolved by animal bodies that still inhabit and react to incoming data from both inner and outer environments. Without adaptation through vagal pathway cues, the human body's capacity to become instruments of higher consciousness is unrealizable. And I'll just add that following Dr. Porges's presentation, Margarita de Vivero Zuber will respond with the first question. Thank you, Dr. Porges, very Thank much you. for Thank being you. with us today. It's my pleasure. And now to do the Zoom challenge of screen sharing. Just let me go. One moment. First, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this conference. Um, for me, uh, I learned in preparing this talk that I am a, what we say, a closet transdisciplinarian, that my world has always been uh, bridging. I just didn't realize how much it was bridging until I tried to prepare this talk. So this is a new type of talk for me to give because my normal audience is either grand rounds doing science presentations at universities or scientific organizations or dealing, trying to communicate through another transdisciplinary manner with clinicians and educators. So I'm just gonna try, this is the first time I'm doing this. So one thing we need to know that as we start talking about this journey to embodiment, that we're really talking about an evolutionary journey of mammals, and we are mammals, into a world of sociality where we have to interact with each other to enable our body to, in a sense, be embodied. And we'll go through this and we'll start talking about how our physiological state can distort or bias our acceptance of information from other perspectives. So many years ago, and uh, I read th this lecture by uh, uh, Snow, and it was called Two Cultures. I was either, I either read it in high school or when I was an undergrad, but I remember it and never forgot it. And it seemed almost like a, a, a pessimistic story of the separation of the basic sciences from the humanities. And you know, I was always interested in in the arts and humanities as well as the science. And I kind of saw this as how do you function within this complex world? Now, I'm going to tell you that it's much worse than he saw in 1959. It's a much worse situation. And what I, this is actually a quote from uh, something I wrote, which I found, and I would really like to share this with you because it was kind of my discussion of, of what I was feeling. And it is, I have spent my entire professional life in the academic scientific community, a community that takes a Tower of Babel approach to scientific inquiry. Often I felt that I was talking to illiterate primitives, although these individuals had doctorates from the major research oriented universities. At times I've struggled to understand the research questions of other disciplines. At other times I have attempted to convey the most basic concepts of my research. I've struggled with communication and have searched for a common vocabulary and scientific metaphor. And over the years, I realized that if you could talk in a way that conveyed the intuitions of your research and your ideas, the acceptability of your ideas in the, with the masses was much, much greater. So this is the bias that we're living with now, in a sense a bias towards STEM disciplines uh, and applied programs. STEM is a shorthand for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's interdisciplinary and applied approach. It is not transdisciplinary 
or shared disciplines, it's separation. And what we start learning, even in the biomedical or mental health areas, that when people use the term interdisciplinary, all they're doing is arguing for a place at the table. They're not, not arguing about sharing underlying principles. They're arguing for resources. Now, in university settings, we know the impact of a bias towards technology and, and science and application when it's done to the humanities. It's basically diverted resources. The departments of humanities are starving, and that is they're not getting university resources. And even the relative salaries of people in those departments are much lower. In fact, we find in most universities, people who have faculty positions in the School of Business are doing as well as surgeons. They're making a very substantial salaries. Um, what's missing? It's missing is this uh, uh, understanding of our body and the embodiment, because what happens is when we're disembodied, we actually are disinterested in humanities. Missing is the understanding of our biology, our nervous system, and how our biology biases our emotional, mental, and behavioral processes, including our boldness, our insights, our creativity, aesthetic expressions, and even our spirituality. Our biology influences our capacity to accept and process novel informations and alternative models. Functionally, our biology determines or limits whether we can even be transdisciplinary, whether that is a viable concept to be shared because it's going to interact with our biology, our physiological state. And what it really means is that if our bodies are in states of threat reactivity, it will limit our intellectual and emotional access to novel information. And those of us who have lived in universities realize that universities are not the safest places. They are at places of chronic evaluation and our nervous system interprets evaluation as threat. So we have lost in discipline defined knowledge, the basic need to connect and truly cooperate with others. And that happens to be our biological imperative is to connect and cooperate. And this actually becomes one of the underlying themes of this talk. And if we don't have this connection, we will fail to appreciate the biases we experience when we are either feeling safe or threatened. So we become very focused on what we know in our niche, our tribe, when we're under threat. But when we feel safe, we get curious, we get bold, and we get creative. So this is like the uneducation of the educated. If we look at uh, the frequency or percentage of bachelor's degrees by major uh, colleges, in the, by uh, discipline major in the United States in 2013, you see this high number on business. And you see that if we go to humanities and the liberal arts, which is what, uh, if we go back to the 60s when, or even the 70s, virtually everyone got their undergraduate degree in liberal arts, which really had some humanities, some science. In a sense, it created an educated person. That's now becoming a small segment of the undergraduate degrees that people are getting. They're getting degrees in applied areas and in a way they're not being educated. They're losing the history of humanity. And in a way disciplines functionally uh, limit our understanding and our creativity. And they put us functionally in a prison. And I used to use the metaphor uh, of a prison to describe being a faculty member in a university. Now this doesn't mean that being a faculty member in a university wasn't beneficial and useful, but it certainly wasn't building bridges across disciplines and allowing people to be creative and novel in their thinking. So we are functionally uh, uh, imprisoned and we have to break those chains. The metaphor that I use is that if we are interested in looking for principles that are not discipline based, but underlie all disciplines or most disciplines, we are functionally playing with a Rubik's cube. We're twisting it and we're trying to find across disciplines whether there's a common theme. And we can see really some relatively simple common themes that in the arts are perceptual facilities, how we see things, how we hear things, they're limited by our biology. So we start to see that biology. We realize that when we are threatened, 
our biology changes, our accessibility and flexibility changes, and we become different. So we start getting some general themes about our own biology and how it links to all these other disciplines. And what is in my mind missing is that we forgot that we are a biological organism, that we are biological and that biology is a flexible biology that shifts states based upon threats or conditions in the environment or health conditions, and they influence how we take information in and how we judge that information. So creativity and productivity in both the sciences and the humanities are dependent on the evolutionary history of human biology and the adaptive features of the human nervous system. And I wanna share this very powerful statement, and that is our biological imperative is to connect and to cooperate, to collaborate. We as a species evolved, I should say, uh, mammals survived as they evolved from ancient reptiles through their ability to cooperate and to share and to be safe in the presence of others. And that we have taken a misunderstanding of survival of the fittest. We think survival of the fittest is the strongest, that those who have the most resources and not those that can co-regulate with others and cooperate. So we can see that there is a science of sociality. We can just look at the newborn baby. And this is a theme that's shared across different mammalian species. And this is the ability for maternal behavior to trigger in the nervous system of the child, of the offspring, to give up all defenses so that the body can now support health growth and restoration. And it's not just giving up the child through the presence of being relaxed on the chest of the mother is enabling the mother to relax as well. So there's a co-regulation occurring. So I'm going to share with you a quote from Theodorus Dobzinski, who was an evolutionary biologist. And he made the statement that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I want to take that statement and move it to other areas of the human experience and basically say intellectual products in the science, arts, and humanities make sense only in light of evolution. And I would all make this more global statement. All human experiences are bounded and biased by our biology. So we can create organizing principles that are oblique or unrelated to our biology. But if we understand our biology as the foundation, it can help us create a more coherent transdisciplinary narrative. So this is the quote from Dobzinski. He says, the fittest may also be the gentlest because survival often requires mutual help and cooperation. And I think this is really way, when we start talking about transdisciplinary, we're talking about a shared agenda of understanding the human experience. Uh, what is this biological imperative? It's what living organisms need to perpetuate their existence. It's survival of the fittest, not the strongest, but those who cooperate and those who help each other mitigate their own threat responses and to co-regulate and to create. So connectedness is this uh, process uh, that we express this biological imperative. It's the body's need to co-regulate our biobehavioral state through engagement with others. Connectedness is the ability to mutually, synchronously and reciprocally regulate our physiological and behavioral state and optimize our social interactions. You see the term synchronous and reciprocal and you realize that in our current culture, which is so digital and asynchronous and often lacks reciprocity, our nervous system is not getting the signals that support this biological imperative. So connectedness enables us to downregulate our defenses. And if we can downregulate our defenses, this is that journey to sociality. This is what made mammals survive, made them special. Connectedness provides that neurobiological mechanism to link social behavior with both mental and physical health, and also to creativity, intellectual uh, expansiveness, uh, and even spirituality. But the main point here is that our sociality is not a social behavior in itself. Our sociality 
is a bio behavior that enables behavior in our biology to regulate, to calm, to optimize its function. If we take from Star Trek a metaphor, feeling safe uh, enables us to explore, to be creative. However, if we have to use our uh, defenses, we use our resources. So in Star Trek was always putting up the energy shields the, to protect, but that uh, is costly. It takes energy and it takes energy away from intellectual pursuits and are using energy as a metaphor because when our body shifts into these defensive states, our accessibility to interact with others, to learn from others, to exhibit a type of intellectual flexibility, to be respectful and to be compassionate of others, this is highly compromised. So the theory that I developed is called polyvagal theory. The name comes from poly meaning many and vagal meaning the cranial nerve. And that mammals had a uniquely mammalian uh, vagal pathway that enabled them to downregulate defenses so they could become social. It was a journey to sociality. So polyvagal theory provides a theoretical basis for a neuroscience of safety and explains how safety promotes spontaneous social engagement behaviors and health growth and restoration. It provides insights regarding the role of feeling safe plays in education, medical care, and social relationships. And I want you to think for a moment, if you're involved and interested in education, how many children have gut pains and other types of symptoms and don't want to go to school. These are merely signals of their autonomic nervous system that they're under states of threat. And what do we tell these children? We say, go to school, get over it. We're not respecting that their body is detecting threat. And because we have to really respect the fact that if our body feels safe, that leads our minds, our mental capacities to be creative and to develop bold new ideas. And it also acknowledges that the chronic evaluation in our educational model triggers costly threat reactions that limits our productivity. And if we think about universities, which are really a model of chronic evaluation, we could say that we have this resource and what are we doing with this intellectual resource? Are we supporting it or are we compromising it? So the models that we use for evaluation compromise how our nervous system works in an intellectual pursuits. We can also apply the same model to medicine. Medicine has become a discipline of evaluation and assessment. How does our body react to evaluation and assessment? Goes into threat reactions. So do you go to a physician to learn about your body, to develop a strategy for health, or do you go to your body, go to the physician and leave in a state of fear, not knowing what to do, assuming that there's that you have some type of deterministic and even fatalistic uh, injury or disease. So the theory that I developed uh, was, as I said, was called polyvagal theory. It was my presidential address to the Society for Psychophysiological Research. The title of the initial paper is actually functionally an abstract of what the theory was about. It was about orienting in a defensive word, meaning attending and engaging. And this is what mammals had to do. But to do this to survive, they had to repurpose their evolutionary heritage. They had to modify the neural pathways that they had inherited from their reptilian ancestors. So the theory is really uh, a part of, it describes an evolutionary journey to sociality. And what I wanna do in this talk is elevate sociality as something that is extraordinarily important in our ability to regulate our physiology and to be creative. All vertebrates have a nervous system that detects threat and reflexively defines, responds to defensively. However, unlike our reptilian ancestors, mammals have a nervous system that detects safety and reflexively calms. This is a powerful piece of knowledge. It means that if we send the right cues to our, to our, our family, our colleagues, our students, our children, their bodies will move out of states of defense and they will become more accessible, both emotionally, physiologically, and intellectually. Depending upon the physiological state we're in, 
we are either socially accessible or we're defensive. Our physiological state influences our accessibility to new perspectives and information. And this needs to be a kind of underlying theme within the strategy of transgenerational studies. Our physiological state determines whether we can even think in a transdisciplinary perspective or whether this is it's viable for us to encourage certain people to think that way. This is a diagram of the autonomic nervous system. It's uh, the nervous system that regulates the organs in our body. Uh, some of you may know terms like the sympathetic nervous system, which is a set of pathways coming off our spine. It, uh, it basically is functionally thought about, thought of as an accelerator. It affects these organs of our body to help get a, more energy out from it. And then juxtaposed to that is a parasympathetic nervous system uh, with, with the primary influences coming from a nerve called the vagus. And this is going to similar organs and in a way they serve, uh, the old model was a paired antagonistic model. But polyvagal theory says that may be partially true, but we react to the environment in a different way. We react with two different vagal pathways because mammals have a, have a second one. They have a, a vagal pathway that goes to the heart and lungs. And this one in the brainstem is connected to the nerves that regulate our facial expressions, our vocalizations, and even whether we can extract human voice from background sounds. So when this ventral vagus is working, it's downregulating the sympathetic defenses. However, we have a more ancient vagal circuit that goes primarily below the diaphragm. And this one can be recruited in defense. And that's why you start getting threat related gut problems. And many people with trauma histories have severe sub uh, problems, organs below the diaphragm. And this gives you that little journey of the autonomic nervous system. And this is our phylogenetic uh, journey of who we are as mammals. And when we reach and become mammals, we have this newer ventral vagal circuit that creates a ventral vagal complex that's linked with the nerves regulating the muscles of the face and head, producing a social engagement system that enables us to calm, but also enables those that we in interact with to be calm by us through that reciprocity. And the more primitive systems are the sympathetic uh, nervous system and this older dorsal vagus, and they have different functions, which we'll learn about in a moment. The head, the cranial nerves regulating the muscles of the face and head, linked to that newer mammalian vagus, which calms us, is really our nervous system of social communication. But when that system is ineffective in moving us into a state of safety or uh, helping us survive, we take that system off. We retract that one so that we have an efficient system to mobilize, to fight or flee. So fight or flight becomes a very prevalent defensive system. And that's being regulated by the sympathetic nervous system. And if that system doesn't serve to move us into a safe place, we immobilize and this is really regulating our visceral organs. And this is that dorsal vagal complex. So our heart rate drops, uh, we have, uh, uh, could have diarrhea, our gut may hurt. So we start going into physiological states that are uh, evolutionarily were conservative for reptiles. And when reptiles were under threat, they immobilized. And with mammals, when they uh, immobilize under threat is potentially lethal. So the uh, polyvagal theory really provides these emergent properties of physiological states really kind of outlined in this figure. We live in an environment where we are bombarded with cues from inside the body and outside the body. And our nervous system evaluates that information through a process that is called neuroception. Uh, neuroception basically says these cues are safe, they're dangerous or they're life-threatening. It's not a perception, it's so rapid. So like if you step into the street and you hear a car horn or brakes being uh, squealing, your body reacts. You don't know what the stimulus was until after you already, already reacted. So neuroception occurs so rapidly 
to save us and to put our bodies into different physiological states without a conscious evaluation. So it's not perception. So when we get cues of safety, our faces become more animated, we make eye contact, uh, our voices become more prosodic, meaning they have more intonation. And as this beaming face and the social interaction occurs, the same neural pathways are supporting how our gut is working. So we are supporting our homeostatic visceral needs through our social interaction. And in fact, when many of us are under threat, how do we mitigate those threat responses? Through social interactions with others. If we get cues of danger, we turn off that social engagement system and we mobilize, we go into a fight flight mode. If we're overwhelmed by, let's say, a large, if we're a child and we're overwhelmed by a large adult, our body gets triggered to potentially a life threat reaction and we may totally shut down. We may pass out. We may, in a sense, immobilize in a state of defense, a very primitive reptilian reaction. And we can see that reaction in the mouse, in the jaws of the cat. And you can see the body of the mouse has lost all muscle tone because muscle tone requires sympathetic activation. So the body just shut down. Children can be so scared that they can pass out and they can literally defecate. And people who have been severely abused, this is actually a description of how they have responded to their abuser. So immobilization as a defense strategy is really not frequently talked about within psychology or psychiatry. They focused on fight flight because they couldn't understand the mechanisms of shutting down. But polyvagal theory basically explained it as this evolutionarily older system of the vagus. They were in this conflict. How could the vagus, which had been viewed in the literature as a system that supported health growth and restoration, how could that same nerve be used in defense? Polyvagal theory clarified that and identified how it worked. And we can see mobilization uh, for fight and mobilization for flight. And we can see how this social engagement system is working because looking at the picture, we see the upper part of the face, the facial nerve of this muscle called the orbicularis oculi, sending cues between the, the child and the adult of safety and enjoyment of interaction. But it's not merely the facial expressivities. The underlying physiology is changing to support health growth and restoration. And we can see these face-to-face -face interactions in a mother-child, peers, uh, a primate with, with her offspring. And we can even see this face-to-face co-regulation in a trans, a species relationship of a dog uh, with, with uh, his or her owner. So these face-to-face -face interactions are functionally neural exercises of the social engagement system, and they become features of therapy, but they also can be applied in the workplace and in education. So the notion of support through face-to-face, -face, through vocalizations, through gestures to support physiology. And we can see the, uh, the immobilization in this picture of the mother and the babies uh, calm in their bodies, but not requiring any high level of muscle tone or defensiveness, but can really appreciate their interactions. So, so we can have physical contact without, while immobilizing without fear. And this is really the optimal state to help us rest, relax, sleep, digest, and perform bodily processes. This state of intimacy enables feelings of trust, safety, and love, but it's a challenge for mammals because it requires safety, and many individuals have a trauma history. If they have a trauma history, their bodies are telling their brains not to trust, not to be embraced, not to come in close proximity. So social behaviors are neural exercises that promote neurophysiological states that support mental and physical health. And these are exercising what I call the vagal break. And this is how that vagus can inhibit sympathetic and calm us down. And this is part of our social engagement system. Connectedness leads to a physiological states of safety and enhanced homeostatic functions leading to health, growth, and restoration. Histories of trauma and abuse 
lower the threshold to trigger defensive behaviors and that disrupt connectedness and the ability to co-regulate. Now, take a quick moment and ask the question, are our academic institutions traumatic? For those who have higher education, have degrees, uh, getting the degree, was it fun? Was it co-regulatory or were there features of trauma involved in or great fear and threat? This, I'm gonna go very quickly through this little phase here. And this is to deconstruct what that social engagement system is. So we see the faces interacting and we see that they feel good, meaning that their viscera is being supported. But let's peel that away and let's say that social engagement system is really the neural regulation through a variety of cranial nerves to deal with uh, muscles of ingestion, muscles of the middle ear, which are for listening, facial muscles, which are for expressivity, muscles of the larynx and pharynx, which is for intonation or vocalization, muscles of head turning and head nodding. And these are wired together in the brainstem with how we regulate our heart and our bronchi. So the features that we express are being regulated by the social engagement system. And in the brainstem, in an area called the ventral vagal complex, all these systems are talking to each other. That's why people who are, quote, anxious have flatter faces, less affect. That's why their voices are higher pitched. Uh, and that's why they may also have difficulty understanding what you're saying. So if you are in a, a discussion in which one person becomes anxious or feels threatened, they will have difficulty understanding what you're saying or literally even hearing what you're saying because the nerves regulating those structures are now changing their control to support fight flight behaviors initially. We can see that the facial nerve, which is regulating that orbital muscle around the eye, has a branch that's going into the ear where it regulates middle ear muscles. So when people look exuberant when you're talking to them, they're able to hear what you're saying much better than if their faces are flat. So we, many of us have lived through, let's say an academic world where people will say to you uh, as they are doing something else that they're listening to what you're saying. Well, they're not listening to you in the same way unless they are looking at you. It's a different process. Not only that, if they look away from you and do something else, your body goes into a different state and your communication skills get compromised. So our neurobiology actually underlies the development of music and how music triggers in our body either a state of a calmness and a wonderment or whether it triggers mobilization. Likewise, architecture can create healing spaces or spaces that are agitating to our body. So neuroception is this neural evaluation of risk in the environment uh, without awareness. It's a reflexive system. Uh, reactions to threat are processed via neural circuits shared with all our, our, virtually all our phylogenetic vertebrate ancestors, yet reactions to safety cues are uniquely mammalian. So moving into this theme of embodiment, we have to understand that our body is on a mission. It's on a quest to be safe. And we are evolved. We evolved with, I've used the term, feature detectors to detect cues of safety which can be intonation of voice, gesture, facial expression. So our neuroception is literally our personal TSA agent. And if we carry with us a trauma history, the threshold to be defensive is going to be manipulated, it's going to be lowered. If we are more resilient, if we have safety in our lives and we have good relationships and co-regulation, the threshold to react just gets raised and we become a more resilient individual. In the world of transdisciplinary studies, what that means is that if our body is in a sense safer, we're interested in alternative models and views. We are basically interested in becoming transdisciplinary. If our bodies are in states of threat, we are not. Anything that breaks our expectations of what we already know is now a threat to us. So we can see if our social engagement system doesn't work, and this is your little exercise to think about your friends and colleagues, about their voices, because if our body has been under chronic 
stress, which is threat, or we have different uh, terms. We have a trauma history or we have a mental health diagnosis. Don't worry about anything specific. Just think that if our body is under a state of chronic threat, what happens to us? We lack intonation in our voice. We have poor eye contact, difficulties in social communication, blunted facial expressivity, difficulties in regulating our behavioral state. We become hypervigilant, anxious, distractible, impulsive. We may have tantrums, or we may become totally hypoaroused, meaning we withdraw and may even dissociate. dissociate. And we have a compromised vagal regulation that could be manifest in cardiac arrhythmias or digestive problems. We would have difficulties listening to verbal commands. We could have speech and language delays. We would have sound hypersensitivities. We might be oral motor defensiveness, which means we're selective eaters with ingestive problems. Uh, limited co-regulation and cooperation with other people and reduce creativity and intellectual integration because creativity and integration violate expectancy and expectancy for many people is a metaphor for their safety. So what does our society do? Does it do a good job uh, creating access to our social engagement system? Do we have sufficient opportunities to exercise the system? What about email and texting? What is that doing? And the bottom line is, are we wasting our creative intellectual resources by supporting states of defense? Is this creating chronic evaluation, which moves our nervous system out of its safety zone? Even in the world of spirituality, we have to think about if we're embodied, if we're safe within our body and we're connected with others, we have a pathway to spirituality versus a pathway of detachment and dissociation. These lead us to different conclusions about our own personal spiritual experience. So the theory transforms the human narrative from a documentary emphasizing events and objects to a pragmatic and often heroic quest for safety with the implicit bodily drive to survive emphasizing feelings. Now, in a transdisciplinary world, polyvagal theory takes information from many different disciplines. Pathology, ontogeny, adaptation, phylogeny, which are common themes within the transdisciplinary world. And we can see that within polyvagal theory, it's reaching over to medicine and health sciences, neuroanatomy, psychology, evolutionary biology, speech and hearing sciences, and comparative and developmental physiology. And we are now learning in the sense that the applications are moving into mental health therapies, healing sounds and music, institutional organizational models, information on how to shift education, treatments for auditory processing deficits, pain treatment models, health-related assessments, and healing spaces, meaning architecture. So we can see that the theory is truly transgenerational, both in its basic background and also more so now in its applications. And we have to think that collaboration uh, leads to creativity and safety is the substrate for collaboration and collaboration is part of our biological imperative. I want you to think uh, really that a lot of this information has been available, but not in a sense integrated. So in medicine, Walter Hess got the Nobel prize in 1949 for a integrated perspective of a brain body system. And basically the quote from the first sentence of his speech is truly transdisciplinary. He says a recognized fact, which goes back to the earliest times is that every living organism is not the sum of a multitude of unitary processes, but is by its virtue of interrelationships of higher and lower levels of control an unbroken unity. This got no traction in contemporary medicine. It was just oblique to their thoughts. So, uh, the basic summary is that once we respect our biological basis, it leads to a transdisciplinary approach. Being in a physiological state of threat or chronic evaluation limits acceptance of other discipline defined knowledge and insights. Being in a physiological state of safety promotes accessibility, cooperation, and connectedness, and opens portals to other discipline defined knowledge and insights. And I, to end, I'd like to, in a sense, uh, say what would happen if 
Descartes were polyvagal in form? Would he have said, I think therefore I am? Or would he have used the reflexive term of saying, I feel myself, therefore I am? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Stephen. That was just a truly um, 40 minutes extraordinary. Uh, I would like to now invite Margarita Deviro Zuber to pose her response and several questions. And at the same time, I'm going to try to watch the chat box on the YouTube for anyone out in the audience who has questions they'd like to ask Dr. Porges that I can relate. Thank you. Margarita. Well, thank you, Susan. <laughs> Due to you, I'm very pleased and honored to, be, to interact with you, Dr. Porges. And especially in this context of the Third World Congress of Transdisciplinarity. So, by foc focusing uh, your presentation on the transdisciplinary perspective, I would like to emphasize the concept of connectedness, <laughs> which resonates uh, for me uh, with the same uh, musicality as reliance, characterized by Edgar Morin in its activating meaning. It's beyond the binary relationship between antagonists. And uh, in this sense, uh, I would like to salute your contribution because um, it, it shed lights on the positive health approach, mm -hmm. and uh, which is the, the heart of my practice and research. And um, studying and promoting the strategies that keep people healthy in the light of the discoveries of the causes that produces the disease. And uh, today's health situation shows us uh, how it's essential to integrate uh, in, in general, in education, this uh, salutogenic approaches and um, that promote connectedness, self and co-regulation, as you said. Uh, and, um, and it always also empower individual, individuals. That's, I, that's what I feel is so important as you presented. So just, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to just uh, begin with my comprehension of what you, you, you presented. Because as a practitioner researcher and I, in perceptual psychic education, my practice is based on the paradigm of the sensible. It's a, it's a new paradigm. And this approach is, endorses the notion of a fundamental organismic um, process that tends toward the individual ability to find their own solutions, as you said. Huh? And um, to this, we add a further dimension. It is the inner movement of the fascia. And, um, at that point, uh, it's a tangible expression of Roger of organismic force, as you, as you presented also. And we call this the sensible body, okay? So perceptual psychoeducation focuses on this inner phenomenon. It's a living, uh, something we can really experience. And particularly, uh, it's a bodily sense felt experience. Hmm? So, there, therefore, I just wanted to underscore the main points uh, where I sense polyvagal uh, theory intertwined with this uh, Danny Bois corporal mediation of the sensible, huh? which is, sen is based in the fascia therapy. Uh, so, uh, as you indicate, nature has wired us to this evolutionary principle that supports sociality optimizing health, growth, and restoration. 
So I, I would like to emphasize the systemic dimension you already talk about, uh, but it's uh, in, how we, uh, in how it implies it in our approach. And um, as you illustrate, this connection, this connectedness, as you say, is not only a metaphor. It, it is, it, since the fascia is a connected tissue beneath the, the, beneath the skin that attaches, stabilizes, and closes and envelopes all the structures of our body. Of course, the, the, uh, the brain, the organs, everything, and of course, the nerves. Huh? So uh, using another metaphor, what I feel when I practice uh, this touch, this kind of very respectful touch, is like, um, it's like if fascia is the paper with the nervous system prints all the single states, maybe among other informants, as you say, as you said. And um, there's an important point is, uh, of course, uh, osteopath knew already many centuries ago this importance of this movement of the fascia, therapeutic and self-regulating uh, force. But what is um, uh, what Daniwa discovered is that um, by a way of an internal psychotonical uh, modulation, it was possible to simultaneously to influence both somatic and the and the mind levels. That's a point that is important also that maybe I would like you to highlight. Just to come to, it, to the point that for me is important in education, huh? it's the fact that the practical instruments which were in Danny Bois' uh, fashion therapy essentially oriented towards a cure became uh, already uh, 20 years ago a, like a vehicle for educating the perception of a sensorial intelligence. As, as you, I think it's very close to <laughs> where you are speaking. So uh, it is also a sense felt before being mental. And uh, uh, we just, uh, we use a relational touch, it also movement of the whole body and of the, the face. Uh, also meditation it would be interesting what you think about meditation and also a verbal dialogue that is important to because it's also the to empower the the subject so that he can become aware of the physiological states like tonalities i i've some heard sometimes heard about uh, your colors you you speak about like uh, no, this, in other words, you use also this the idea of tonalities and the meaning it emanates from the, this living force, from this experience, yeah. you know? yeah. and, uh, and it also recontact and has an impact on health, exactly as you said, health, social relations, and also creativity potentialities. So if you, I would like you, maybe if you can uh, shed light on, on this uh, unity of the, of the, of our organism. Well, well, thank you. Actually, very, very insightful comments and really, let's, let's break it down to the terminology I would use. You, your manipulations are neural exercises of embodiment. They're metaphorically and also uh, that's what they're doing. And they're really uh, taking your patient or your client or your student on a personal journey of becoming re-embodied because they're getting the feedback from their body. So if we start with the neural exercise and we start building the model that if the body is not in a state of defense, that portal opens up for a neural exercise in which the fascia becomes more uh, palpable, more easily moved. In fact, many somatic therapists, they are not necessarily dealing directly, well, they're dealing with fascia, they may not know they're dealing with fascia, but 
they're using that acoustic intervention I developed called the safe and sound protocol because it makes their clients' bodies more accessible to being touched, which is part of the dialogue of the therapist with the client when you're doing any type of somatic manipulation. The client has to functionally invite the therapist to touch their body. And so what you're dealing with in the initial level is a neural exercise that is requesting a co-regulatory component to lead to a self-regulatory process. So if we think about as a model, when a baby is born, the baby is totally co-regulated. That co-regulation and that support provides the resource for the baby to develop into a self-regulatory organism. And in a, in a way with somatic manipulations like you're describing, you're going back to maturationally or developmentally to first enable a co-regulation, your manipulations, that then become internalized or embodied. And that gets reflected as self-regulation. And the nervous system, in the model that I've been using lately is basically saying, we're back in our body, we're, we're embodied. And when we're not in our body, we have numbness. Now, from a neuroscience perspective, numbness is not, not detecting our feedback systems. So our organs are now, in a sense, trying to do their job on their own without a master control system, our brain. And our brain evolved to regulate these organs to move their functions from a homeostatic safety one where it, it supports and heals to defensive ones or play. Play is mobilization with that social interaction occurring. And what do we like more? I mean, play is what we really love. We like to move, but we really don't wanna move under states of fear or threat or aggression. We wanna move with a smile on our face. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, may I still ha I have oh, at least one or two questions? <laughs> Thank you, because what I, I understand of what you said is also this um, intertwining of our, of our body. If you touch one part, it is all, uh, yeah. already interacting, no? Yeah. One and the other. So both uh, is like a transdisciplinary uh, approach. <laughs> right. And, and if we think in the world of modern medicine, and in a sense, the post uh, Descartes world that we're all in, everything got separated and the brain got separated from the body. So much of medicine, you go to specialists who have no knowledge that the organs they're working with have a brain component, have a nervous system component. Likewise, when you deal with muscles or tissue or posture or structure, people They're just not, they don't have the mental uh, metaphors and they don't have the knowledge base to understand it. I want to go back to one thing, and this is the area of fascia. And fascia is really, even though there's a lot of interest relative to, interest in it now, relative to 30 and 40 years ago, there's still very little knowledge about how it relates to neuroregulation of the autonomic nervous system. Yet you see all these comorbidities. And especially with chronic pain, there are people with you know, so-called chronic pain and autonomically their bodies are in a state of defense. And many of them get rid of their chronic pain when they feel safe. And what happens to fascia when you feel safe? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, yes. so the bottom line of that is the somatic therapies actually have two portals. They have a portal of direct manipulation But the other portal is probably more important. That is psychoeducational. That is creating the metaphor where the person honors their body for what it's doing. Even if it's in a state of defense, they learn that the body has done that to protect them. And now through the psychoeducational, you convince the body to just become accessible. Yeah, both. It's important, yes. Well, there's another point I would like to highlight. Since um, uh, having learned music with uh, Martino, uh, it's a Martino method, uh, mm -hmm. and having uh, conducted transdisciplinary research, it, 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 um, I uh, support an inter integral educational project that integrate also uh, Willem's music education 
And they both had a real knowledge about physiology, psychology, and they, they even uh, invent some uh, uh, me mechanical uh, and um, uh, aids. Mm -hmm. so it's important because I know you, you work with also with sound. And um, through my experience, what I feel and I, what I study also through my uh, research is uh, that is uh, an active uh, support to access uh, to our uh, social engagement. Music is a real support. Uh, well, we evolved. The, the major transition for uh, mammals from reptiles was that they had certain frequencies that they were able to use to communicate safety. That happens to be what we use in music as melody. So they're well-defined or maternal vocal voices capturing. So vocal music primarily by women uh, in terms of classical music, it's going to be violins, flutes, clarinets, uh, conveying these melodies are in a sense biologically based to the physics and physiology of our middle ear structure. So there's a, a deep science here. And the science is that if we give these cues to our nervous system, the nervous system will become accessible and calm down. So yes. it's not as it's weird stuff, it's understanding how the system works. Yes, it's so, a for, for both of them, Martineau and Hillens, they really st uh, study music as a science because mm -hmm. it, it works with all the muscles and, and when you prepare to sing, you yeah. are already uh, yeah. working with all the, this uh, different so, my examples are really about very personal because I was a clarinetist. And so it was all about breath. It was all about the embouchure of the muscles of the face and listening and slow exhalation, which is very meditative and very uh, thought processing and very important for a neurophysiological exercise. So when I talk about wind instruments and singing at any of my talks, I always get questions and the questions are, we don't agree with you because we're percussionists, we're keyboard players, we're string instruments, and we breathe the same way. Because when you're a clarinetist or a singer, you're exhaling as you play the phrase and you're inhaling to start a new phrase. So you're literally constrained for this massive neural exercise. But these other musicians say, look, you guys who play the wind instruments, fine. And if you sing, fine. But we do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I have a last, last question, if it's yeah. possible. Okay. So it's because um, I am currently conducting a transdisciplinary research mm -hmm. with a physician and a gestalt psychologist mm -hmm. to help uh, uh, people who are being infected by COVID-19 as well as a preventative program. So I really, I would like if you just give us some examples, if you have some integrative methods that you have developed. Yeah. Well, I'm very, of course, very interested in the pandemic because um, we're living it. Um, we did research projects on it and people who have a trauma history and their autonomic nervous system subjectively has been more reactive have more mental health symptoms, more worry symptoms, trauma symptoms, but the pathway from their trauma history to, to their symptoms goes through whether or not their nervous system is retuned to be more threat oriented. I'm getting feedback from people who are using my the safe and sound protocol, which is using vocal music, but is amplifying the prosodic features of it to such a degree that the nervous system basically can't refuse it. Think of it as distilled, the distilled essence of trust. So the body does that. Now, there uh, one woman who was a psychiatrist from Chile, whose husband was a nephrologist, and he's in the intensive care unit. She makes sure that he hears it every day. And in fact, the physicians now are making sure he hears it every day in the intensive care unit. And there are a few uh, people are doing that. The reason it's effective is that it functions as if it were a vagal nerve stimulator. So by having, is it so like listening to Mozart or listening to melodic is comforting and can calm down. 
This is a sense an amplification of the features that calm the body down. So it's functioning like an, an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator. So that my suggestion is melodic uh, vocal music is going to be helpful if you have access to a clinical provider that can deliver the safe and sound protocol. That's more, that would be more effective, but it doesn't mean that listening to Mozart or melodic music would not be helpful. Yes, of course. And, and, and maybe a silence because uh, I don't know if we have some uh, studies on meditation. I, I have no studies on meditation, but yeah, I, I've written on uh, compassion and, and the relationship with the vagus. And the issue is when you exhale slowly, and that's part of meditative practices. That's when that ventral vagal break is actually, is working. So it's calming you down. So you don't wanna become meditative when you're in a sense state of anxiety. And what uh, we, what I see again, listening to clinicians is if they, in, if they try to have trauma survivors do meditative processes, often the closing of the eyes creates a sense of vulnerability. So you have to, in a sense, be very careful about the history of the individual because going into a state of what would be called the state of safety for others is a state of vulnerability for, for people with a trauma history. So their body gives up its defenses, but the programming that was left from the traumatic experience says, mm -hmm. last time my body was accessible, what happened to me? So the trauma therapist are getting very informed about the triggers and paradoxically triggers of safety like eye contact or meditation with people with severe trauma histories can actually trigger. So with techniques like breathing techniques and like the safe and sound protocol, the therapists are in a sense creating neural exercises. It's very much like what you're doing, moving them in and out of their body, giving them the feedback of understanding their body. And once their body gets that knowledge base of that interaction, then they function much better. I'm going to um, have to bring now a few questions. Of... Thank you, Margarita, very much. That exchange was very helpful, I think. Um, a few questions from the audience. Um, Domingo Adam would like to ask if polyvagal has a connection with haptonomy from Belgium. Actually, you... Susanna, Susanna, I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, well, you can send me an email and- They have, to, okay, I'll have, I, I can send you that question by email. Um, Edward would like to ask if uh, experiments are being made in schools now. Um, there are people using the technology in schools. The safe and sound protocol has been used with autistic kids and reduced their hypersensitivities and uh, language development. Uh, there's lots of research going on. I'm not running all the research. There's a time for other people to get involved. But the educators are getting very interested in this whole issue of physiological regulation of students because we've been, you know, let's say it's 100 years in which behavior had been viewed as an intention of the child and children have been abused and punished for, their, for acting out or for becoming uh, impulsive when really their physiology is really uh, the vulnerability. So if the therapies can target the, the physiological state without pharmaceuticals, but through neural exercises, mm -hmm. then the child gains this other capacity to regulate. So the answer is lots of work is going on. I'm not necessarily doing it. Um, many questions really revolve around fear. Fear that humans naturally engage with when um, they're moving beyond boundaries. And we could say transing or um, fear that is coming from the somatic defense and or um, new experiences, let's say. So Victoria 
Devaros asks, if in your practice, how do you deal with fear when a child says to their mother, I'm afraid of the swimming pool, for example? So first of all, let's start off by, I'm not a clinician. I don't have a practice. I develop ideas, I do research, and I encourage uh, clinicians to apply the technologies I develop, but I'm not a clinician. Uh, the first part about fear is really about honoring and respecting the child's physiological state. Uh, the issue is that we tend not to acknowledge it because we tend to see other people's experiences through the lens of our own body and we are disrespectful to others. So we would say, oh, that doesn't bother me, go ahead and do it. But the child or the other adult is telling them this is really disruptive, they're feeling bad. So the first thing is we have to understand our evolutionary history and how through that evolutionary history have we mitigated, removed the elements of threat when we were threatened. We removed it through social interaction, through talking, through listening, to being witnessed by another. So I think what's missing in most dialogues is that we try to fix things without witnessing the other person's reaction. I think most people want to be heard and in being heard, we feel that we're being supported. If when we tell people about how we feel and they want to fix it or they want to berate it or evaluate it, our bodies stick in that state of threat. So if we have an audience and we feel that we are well witnessed, I think our nervous system will start to mitigate the threat through supportive social interactions. Bottom line, we need to learn to be better witnesses of our friends, our children, and even of ourselves. Um, one last question from Christian. Uh, what do you think about the possibility that the brain are only the hard and the reality of the complex phenomena of the mind, the rational thinking is to be the result of some soft programs. Um, th this has to do with what metaphors you wanna use. Uh, one metaphor in terms of the notion of a program or a flexible or soft program is that the information is really evolving from inside the organism and it's part of an emergent property. It's a viable and plausible model. Another one that is not frequently mentioned, which I find extremely intriguing, is a reconceptualization of our nervous system, not as a generator, but as a transducer, where we're taking energy or information, which energy is information, and our nervous system is transducing it. And that places the locus of input outside of us, but it puts the, let's say, almost the responsibility of what we do with that information as inside. So I think I, I'm not a person who uh, spends, I would say, any time within my science world thinking about the basis of consciousness. Now, there are others who do. I basically will, uh, the simplest one to really say is think of it as an emergent property. And that's how I've dealt with issues of spirituality and other things. If our body is in, in specific states, we have different emergent properties. And what many people call spirituality, or they might call something consciousness, is a property of the system if it's in certain states. If it's in a different state, it will have different emergent properties. Okay. I think that we We'll have to stop here, even though there's tremendous interest. And I have put uh, the Polyvagal Institute link into the chat so that other um, future events that Dr. Porges is conducting through workshops with Deb Dana, um, you can see where those events and those courses are now being offered. Thank you, Steve, um, for being with us today so much. You're quite welcome, Susanna, and thank you for inviting me. I, let me say that it's been a good intellectual challenge for me. <laughs> and I should also say that Steve will be joining us again on Friday in conversation with Harold Terry Lindahl. So that will be a, another opportunity to touch in with Stephen um, at the end of the week. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay.
So our next presentation is pre-recorded from Sydney, Australia. Dr. Joseph Aziz um, worked uh, with me um, in December to make this recording available. The sound is a little uh, soft and so I ask everyone to raise the level of their volume with the hope that we can communicate um, both a little bit of a Australian accent with um, the bandwidth available. Dr. Joseph Aziz is a priest in the Maronite Catholic Church where he serves as chancellor. He is also an honorary associate at the University of Sydney. For 23 years, he was a practicing attorney. He is the author of Gurdjieff, Mysticism, Contemplation and Exercises published by Oxford University Press in 2020. The title of his talk, Higher Energies, Higher Food, the Practical Reality of the Spiritual Life. Following Joseph's talk, Jack Kane from Ontario will bring the first question. Welcome, Joseph. Thanks, Susan. Joseph, you can you can begin now. Good. For George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, who died in 1949, I suggest the key concept is that as we are, we do not directly perceive much more than a small portion of objective reality, but we should and can develop our innate potential for coming to a state in which we can approach this. And the key to this is found in the title of his third series of writings, Life is Real Only Then When I Am. I shall shortly say something about who Gurdjieff was, his life and times, but first, I think it may be better to develop the key concept as I have termed it, if only because once we understand something of his aim, we understand why he wanted people to concern themselves only with his teaching and not with himself. As we are, said Gurdjieff, our state is forever fluctuating. We do not have one stable state of consciousness. We sleep at night and when we awake, we find ourselves in one of a variety of states. We can be more or less sleepy, more or less alert. This is not something to gloss over. It is a clue to the nature of our waking state, which Gurdjieff called waking consciousness or a relative state of consciousness. In this condition, we are able to relate to the world around us, something not possible in sleep, where we are utterly prone and passive. But there are certain features about our relative state of consciousness, which lead us to conclude that it is in fact a state of hypnotic wakefulness, or what amounts to the same thing, a state of hypnotic sleep as measured by the states of consciousness we could enjoy. 
in the relative state of consciousness, and I stress once more that this is a shorthand way of speaking of the range of states, we do not perceive much more than a small portion of objective reality. In this state, none of us can truly say, I. We are full of conflicting thoughts, emotions, and attitudes. As we are, our bodies are stimulated by external influences and impressions, and these produce in us corresponding desires, which provoke corresponding thoughts. We are effectively automatons under the influence of externals, but we are adept at explaining, justifying, and defending our passing desires and small wills as being consciously chosen. Sometimes a particular group of desires are stronger and more permanent in a person, but this is again the chance result of external factors. The obsession is internalized, and to us it appears to be mine. We identify, to use Gurdjieff's word, with our smallest whims and our most powerful infatuations alike. If this is how we appear as a gender portrait, then in detail it can be said, we have three main centers of operation, our intellect, our emotions, and our physical apparatus. Each of these functions has a center or brain. These centers are not always well connected one with the other as they should be in a healthy person. In fact, said Gurdjieff, these two states of sleep and waking consciousness are directly related to the degree to which our centers are connected. Full and refreshing sleep occurs when the three centers are disconnected one from the other and they can recruit their energies. Bad sleep is a function of connections between centers continuing as we try to sleep. Hence, the phenomenon of turning thoughts or emotional disturbance keeping us awake at night. As he once said, one centered activity is hallucination, two centered activity is semi hallucination, three centered is none. The lack of internal connection between centers usually becomes worse as we grow older, not least because we become more entrenched in mechanical habits and more conditioned by external factors. Whereas what a child feels, the whole of the child feels and also thinks, with us, there is invariably a disconnection between mind and emotion. Each of our centers optimally works with a specific energy. This means that all of the centers are material, matter being one aspect of energy, and force likewise being another aspect of matter and energy. Where there is matter, there is force, and there is also energy. Therefore, not only our bodies, but also our intellect and emotion are material. But they are of a materiality which is finer than that of the physical body. We have now mentioned two states of consciousness, sleep and relative or waking consciousness. There were also two higher states available for us, self-remembering or self-consciousness, and then objective consciousness. Higher levels of knowledge are available 
in each higher state. Hence, while asleep, we cannot know the truth, for we cannot distinguish dreams from reality. In relative consciousness, we can know relative truth. We can see that we are awake and not asleep, that we cannot fly, that if we are not careful crossing the road, we may be run down, and we can learn languages, practice sports, and so on. Self-consciousness, the first stage of a consciousness in touch with some reality, is a function of the operation of the first of the higher senses, what Gurdjieff called higher emotional centers. These higher centers use a finer energy than that used by the lower centers, and they can directly perceive both subjective and objective reality. I repeat, all the centers are organs of knowledge. The knowledge of the centers is of different kinds, but all are of use to us. A simple example is how an unimaginative pedant cannot comprehend and may even despise the reasons of a person who has been influenced by their feeling. If we have these higher centers and all centers are organs of knowledge, then why do we not always sense reality? Shortly, to receive the results of their working, the lower centers must be harmoniously related among themselves and also related to the higher brains. We return again to the importance of unity within, so as to be corresponding to the cosmic unity. It is rather as if some parts of the machine had to be operating before other parts could be engaged. Our ordinary centers work too slowly and too chaotically to mesh, as it were, with the higher centers. Imagine a relay race where a runner fumbled each time he tried to pass the baton because he was too slow and awkward to pass it smoothly to the next runner. Also, the higher centers themselves need more of the finer energies proper for them to be able to achieve a certain solidity within what Gurdjieff called our common presence. Gurdjieff had much to say about these finer energies and how to manufacture them so that we could use them. Now, Gurdjieff had a method. Gurdjieff said that we should and can develop our innate potential for coming to reality. All his many diverse ideas and techniques serve becoming conscious of one's own reality as an actual vivid experience. And through that experience, to correspond within human limits to objective reality. Hence, as I've mentioned, he wrote that life is real only then when I am. His life's work was to share the possibilities which I had discovered of touching reality and if so desired of even merging with it. And in that, that merging, the sense of my present reality is central. It is a different life. One's consciousness shifts to a level which is self-evidently fuller, higher, impartial. There are no thoughts, but there is consciousness. For all thought implies a certain consciousness, but it by no means follows that all consciousness includes thinking. 
it is a possible state which is replete with a sense of I am here. I am where I should be, as I should be. I am in my place, and yet I am related to my history and to my experience. I am this, but neither am I separate from that. This is a subjective experience of reality. Beyond this, an objective experience of reality is possible, but we can say little about it. It is impossible to fully put this experience of subjective reality into words. The effort to do so is necessarily misleading because the words impose a uniformity on the experience, which is not true to it. Perhaps the strongest impression in such states is the sense that I am, that I exist. But because I exist as an individual, a unique configuration of consciousness, energy and experience, even this fundamental impression will always and necessarily be individual and unique and therefore will challenge, if not defeat, comparison. Once one has had this experience of being separate from one's own thoughts and feelings, of abiding above them, as it were, there begins a revaluation of all science, art, and craft in line with Gurdjieff's of science of being. To attain to consciousness of and in reality, even if only by moments, is to realign all one's values in that. I have made my individual contribution to a deeper comprehension of Gurdjieff's work in my 2019 study, Gurdjieff, Mysticism, Contemplation and Exercises, Oxford University Press. There, I suggested that Gurdjieff could best be described as a mystic. This is not because he was not a thinker, an artist, a craftsman, or a scientist. He was all of these. But the goal of mysticism, the experience of the presence of God, is the highest pursuit possible for humanity. And therefore, to say that Gurdjieff was a mystic is to typify him by reference to what is highest in his work. Neither is there any contradiction between being a scientist and a mystic, both are ways of approaching knowledge. Now, once we understand something of what Gurdjieff's ideas and methods were, we can understand why he did not wish to point to himself. In fact, he wished to hide himself, as it were. And so we come to his life and then the final point of this paper. Briefly, Gurdjieff was born in Gilumi, Armenia, then known as Alexandropol, most likely in 1877, but possibly as early as 1866. Let's not be distracted by this solidity. He died in 1949 in Paris. These two facts are a symbol of his life. He began in the East and he brought everything he had to the West where he left his body. There is no question except that he claimed to have penetrated the places of initiation and esoteric wisdom in Asia, places of a nature which existed nowhere else on earth. He appeared in Russia in about 1911 teaching a system which might be compared to theosophy and anthroposophy, in that it was replete 
Institute for Cosmology, Anthropology, and Psychology, and methods for attaining to certain powers, which were said to be potential, but rarely realized. Gurdjieff was no less controversial and colorful than Blavatsky. During the last 38 years of his life, the teaching years, he based himself first in Russia until the revolution forced him into a period of wandering until he settled in France, where he remained from 1922 to 1949, making certain journeys in Europe and many voyages to the USA. Although he wrote a three volume masterwork titled Belzebub's Tales to his grandson, his writings were only published posthumously. During his life, he was chiefly known for his talks and for his sacred dances or movements. In what I might call the Gurdjieff tradition, ideas of thought and his practical techniques are developed and applied. In addition, his music, chiefly piano music, is valued. Probably all the groups which call themselves Gurdjieff groups use meditative exercises, but so far as I can see, few of them use the authentic Gurdjieff contemplation like exercises, what Gurdjieff called transformed contemplation. Even if most of them use exercises which we mistakenly think pale in Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff has a rather mixed reputation in academic circles, with a few instances where he is known to academics at all. To the best of my knowledge, if he is mentioned in university courses, it is in the area of religious studies, especially when treating of Western esotericism and new religious movements. He does not seem to feature in philosophy, theology, or psychology units. I think Gurdjieff would have been quite unmoved, even indifferent to this. On the one hand, some, like Anthony Storr, criticised him, saying, Reviewing this picture of the universe, it is hard to understand that any intelligent, educated person could believe in it. One perspective on Gurdjieff is decidedly negative, the other is decidedly positive. Perhaps the very root of the differing assessment of Gurdjieff is the difficulty of categorizing him. If one approaches him as a divisor of intellectual systems, judging him on modern Western rationalist criteria as Storr does, one would be more likely to come to the conclusion which Storr did. If, however, one sees him as offering an esoteric teaching based on knowledge and methods of awakening long forgotten in the West, as do Brown and colleagues, then Gurdjieff will appear as someone not to be judged by the standards applied to philosophers or even theologians in the Western academic tradition. Again, I think Gurdjieff would be indifferent to either opinion. He saw himself bringing a teaching with the potential to cause a revolution in the internal worlds of people. And if enough people experienced this, to change the wider world. For this reason, J.G. Bennett died in 1974, one of Gurdjieff's most accomplished pupils. Titled his major study of his teacher, Gurdjieff, Making a New World. Yet, these methods and ideas, by their very nature, can never be popular and can only be adopted and practiced by individuals 
actually collaborating with Catholics. As I have mentioned, not all in the Burge expedition use his exercises. Yet, my main interest has been in the contemplation like exercises. An important part of these exercises is the elaboration and conscious use of energy. To come to a state of self-remembering, energy is needed. Our bodies elaborate a lot of energy, but much of it is wasted by negative emotions, for example, hatred, anger, jealousy, self-pity, and by useless functioning, such as unnecessary talking, whether external or internal, unnecessary suffering and nursing grievances, daydreaming, and muscular tension. Further, we do not produce enough of the higher energies needed for the linking of the lower and higher centers. We have, said Gurdjieff, three foods, that is, three sources of nourishment for the centers. These are ordinary food and drink, but also air and impression. Air is a food. Without it, the organism dies. Even with poor quality air, the body suffers, and one's mental workings are impaired, and rejected suggest one's feelings. But the most critical food of all for anyone wishing to work with the higher centers to experience subjective reality is the food of impressions. Now impressions in Gurdjieff is a very broad term, comprehending both external and internal perceptions, for example, of internal pain or pleasure, or of our own thoughts and feelings, of our entire state and the state of other people. One sometimes senses that there is something, as we say, in the air. Certain fine impressions, what we might call religious impressions, are not received by all people. Or rather, they could learn to receive them, but they strive past them. I am emphatically not saying that one receives higher impressions by taking music appreciation or wine tasting courses. These are all impressions of the same order as hearing any music or appreciating any food, only more detail. The religious impressions I am referring to fall on the feeling centre, and the chief obstacles to receiving them are negative emotions and identification with whatever is occupying us at any moment. Further, Gurdjieff have spoke about certain high energies, so fine that we can only call them impressions by agreement and in lieu of a better word. These can be, he said, digested and assimilated. Some of his contemplation-like exercises were given for the purpose of connecting the interpreter with what he called accumulators of energy, small accumulators and a large accumulator of energy located with each human body, and then greater accumulators located at a planetary level, and hence available to all individuals. To Spensky, Gurdjieff said, small accumulators suffice for the ordinary everyday work of life, but to work on oneself or inner growth, and for the efforts which are required of the man who enters the way, 
the energy from the small accumulators is not enough. We must learn how to draw energy straight from the large accumulator. Gurdjieff later added another level to this when he said to John Bennett, Ever since I was a young boy, I have known the existence of this power, that is, the great reservoir or accumulator of higher emotional energy, and of the barriers that separate man from it. And I have searched until I found the way of working through them. This is the greatest secret that man can discover about human nature. I shall not present it here in any detail, but I have developed the thesis that Gurdjieff was practically permanently connected, not only with the large accumulator, but more importantly, with the great reservoir or accumulator beyond that. In a talk that Bennett gave in October 1965 to a Gurdjieff group in Stockholm, Trent, he said, one cannot lift oneself from one level to another without help from a higher level. This has to be grasped and grasped again and assimilated and remembered. The help that we receive is limited by one thing only, and that is our capacity to receive it. This enlarging of the capacity to be able to receive is sometimes called the opening of the heart because the heart is compared to a vessel. Heart here does not mean emotion. It is different. If you know what is meant in the language of the system by the higher emotional center, that is the vessel that I am talking about. For most people, the higher emotional center is no larger than a thimble, but it is made of such material that it is capable of growing without roots. If only we could be given the power to see this, it is invisible to ordinary eyes. Now in conclusion, much has been left unsaid because time is limited. But to draw this together, I see there has been four aspects of Gurdjieff's work, which is how he referred to his ideas and methods when put into practice. These aspects are to some extent synchronous. They have to go on simultaneously, especially the first three. But the emphasis at the start must, I think, be on the earlier or preparatory aspects. And all these three aspects are preparatory to the four. The first stage, I would say, is education. Receiving the teaching, that is the ideas. And this will involve formulating an aim, at least provisional. The second is cleansing, the struggle to awaken, that is, struggling with the features of sleep, struggling with chief feature and sacrificing one suffering. In the early days, Gurdjieff referred to this once as creating mood in oneself. And I think it's a good description, which is why I've taken it out of the archives. The third aspect is nourishing or what we call in mystical discourse, illumination. This is spiritualizing the body, relaxing and awakening it through conscious sensation and filling it with feeling. I see these as three aspects of sensation differentiated by whether the passive, active or reconciling force is being mediated by sensation. Gurdjieff did not say that in those words. This is my interpretation of what he said. 
but certainly the techniques I'm referring to, which have led me to that, are authentic virtue with no admixture. This stage he referred to also as creating sun in oneself. And this aspect is marked by the crystallization of the astral body, what he also called the Kesjan body, the body of the higher emotional center. Now, the fourth stage and the critical stage is consolidation, the connection with the great reservoir. And this connection is needed to make permanent what has been gained. I don't wish to give the impression that the great reservoir is innate. The contents of the great reservoir are beyond description. But one should not and cannot think of them as inert or things. There's a mystery to it. But we are now in a place where really, I think without experience in the group, it's impossible to say much more. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, Susanna, just a moment, please. Uh, I'm going to introduce Jack King, who's from Ontario, Canada, who will bring the first question. Susanna, can you hear me? Thanks, Susanna. Susanna, can you hear me? <clears throat> Joseph, I'm, I have a question about the, the big accumulator. Provided for each of the three centers, body, mind, and feelings or emotions, so that a balance is achieved and maintained. By not interfering, that's the main thing. Uh, by relaxing and not interfering, it's always the primary and the basic effort which is required. I've spoken about relaxing, sensing the body. If one does this, those energies will find their right place. They will go to where they are needed because at different times, they may be needed in different Hello. places. Um, Many years ago, I had the great good fortune to meet Mrs. Stable. This was right. 24 years ago. And I described a certain experience to her. Maria, tell me what I was speaking about. Maria, please stop the recording. We are having problems with it. Please. Please stop the recording. We are having problems with the recording. And uh, it's the, the PowerPoint didn't show and the recording was very uh, confusing. Uh, so I think it's better if we can, if we can ask Brenner to start his presentation because people were not able to listen to what uh, Assisi was saying, most people. And uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you now. Um... I have only one screen, so I'm not able to watch <clears throat> the YouTube or chats. Um, but sure, let's uh, move forward with, with Joseph Brenner's talk. Uh, Joseph? Uh, we don't have Joseph here.
Maria, where is Brenner? Maria, Maria, where is Brenner? Maria, you have to unmute. Maria. Tu microfono, Maria. Microphone, microphone, Maria. Where is Brenner? Maria, please. Yes. Uh, he, he was on mute because he could not uh, follow and understand the recording. And now he, he has to be back again. So I'm, I'm, I'm communicating with him for him to be online again. Okay, I'm back because I... Great, Brennan. Great, Brennan, you're back. Yes, so I am back. Oh, fine. Some, something so... happened. Uh, to démarrer le video, oui, bien sûr. Voilà. Yeah. Okay, fine. Damien. Yes, I had, of course, the difficulties, unfortunately, with the previous speaker, and uh, I'm sorry about that, because I'm sure he had something good to say. So would you like me to start now? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so uh, greetings from Switzerland. Now my slides won't move. Um, just just press your in your in your computer uh, the the next next you know the arrow that points going forward. Maybe that will be work, will work. I'm blocked. Yeah? I'm blocked, I'm just blocked on one screen. Oh, can, um, here, here you have a, an arrow, try this arrow. Try it, try it now. No. The arrow on your keyboard, Joseph? The arrow on my keyboard, none of them work. Wow. Oh, we hear each other anyway, that's something. I don't know how to go back to where I was. Um, Try, try, is there an arrow on, on the screen for you? Yes. There yeah. it is. Okay. Fine. There we are. Fine. It was so so faint I didn't see it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it's okay oh, now. Uh, with that, I will continue. So over the last 20 years, I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with Professor Basarab Nicolescu. Basarab. In the context of the International Center for Transdisciplinary Research, CIRET. My task has been and still is to make the philosophical logic of Stefano Pasco and its extensions by Nicolescu accessible to English language readers. Over this period, I have benefited from the insights and assistance of Maria de Mello and of Vittoria Barros who published my first book about the logic of Lupasco in Brazilian Portuguese. I was introduced to Nicolescu and to his work with Lupasco by René Berger, the major 20th century observer of the development of the media. Through Basarab, I also met Michel Camus, 
who, together with Nicolescu, Edgar Morin, Michel Rondon, and other key figures of the French intelligentsia and Lupasco were founders of CIRET. I can think of no better way to start any discussion of Lupasco's work than to recall the statement made by Morin during his presentation at this Congress. Lupasco est le maître à nous tous. Lupasco is the master of all of us. The life and work of Stefan Lupasco have come to me in three ways, through his books in French still in print, through personal contacts and discussions with Nicolescu, as well as his numerous books and articles in which Lupasco's logical system is presented, and through the 1999 memorial volume on Lupasco entitled Stefan Lupasco, The Man and the Work published under the direction of Horia Badescu and Nicolescu. This book provides a fascinating description of Lupasco as a man and a thinker through the reminiscences and anecdotes of his daughter, the attorney Alda Lupasco Masso, and the painter Georges Mathieu, and interviews with and articles by many of his colleagues, friends, and collaborators. It also includes a complete bibliography of publications by and about Lupasco. Another important source is the compendium of articles published in 2010 under the auspices of UNESCO at the confluence of two cultures, Lupasco today. Nicolescu has recalled that Lupasco was deeply affected by the stubborn resistance of the academic community to honest debate and discussion of his new principles and postulates. It was with an understandable bitterness that Lupasco saw in this resistance another example of the operation of his principles. In a small way, I have relived, this, relived the same experience in the refusal of people to accept the Lupasco system as a logic. The logical philosophy of Stefan Lupasco is grounded in the physical science that was familiar to me as a chemist. It has been the guide to my personal program of study for the last 20 odd years. Application of the principles of transdisciplinarity of which log the logic of Lupasco is a pillar in the acceptation of Basarab Nicolescu enabled me to find in both logic and philosophy what was essential for me, principles of tolerance, but also rigor. This was different language from the mass of wishful thinking and self-serving abstractions that had turned me off from philosophy in the first place. Lupasco's state thesis of 1935 was originally conceived as a study of method, and he wanted to give it the title of Sketch of a New Discourse on Method. Lupasco's new method, quote, would consist in seeking in the presence of any phenomena, none, first, what is its contradictory phenomenon, and second, to what extent it potentializes or is potentialized by it. The key passage in Lupasco's text continues. In a general way, one must link the rational and the irrational, identity and non-identity, the invariant and the variant, by the constitutive relation of contradictory complementarity, of a duality of dynamic terms with the principal double aspect, including for each term, the passage from actual to potential and the passage from actual potential to actual and actual to potential, each of the terms acting on the other. One must avoid the sterile parallel conceptions of contradictory orders, as well as a monism favoring one order by applying the notion of error or appearance to the other. Lupasco's entire oeuvre 
can be described as starting from epistemological, logical, and phenomenological examples of antagonistic dualism and the development of three corresponding subjects of argument, intensity and extensity in energy, the knower and the known, affirmation and negation. The study of these dualisms led Lupasco to the formulation of his principle of antagonism or dynamic opposition, whose subsequent development culminated in an increasingly elaborate conception of knowledge, human consciousness, and higher level mental and social phenomena, creative activity, art, and ethical behavior. Some of these things are directly related to the work of the first speaker. And I look forward to looking very mu much more closely than I have about some of the concepts that are related to Lepasco's work in this sense. Of the three major lines of argument, the first and second had their origins in the thesis, and the third appears in detail in Lupasco's Logic and Contradiction of 1947. His logic was formalized in 1951 in the principle of antagonism and the logic of energy, in which, as Nicolescu has pointed out, the included middle or third, quotes, the keystone of Lupasco's philosophy appears for the first time. This work is not purely theoretical. Its principles apply to the operation of consciousness and cognitive activities. A unique fe feature of the Lupasco system is the place it gives to implication as a physical as well as semantic operator. In standard logic, implication is not much more than a statement of logical consequence, the statement that one proposition is the consequence of, of another. On the other hand, the role of implication was very clearly, came out very well in the first speaker. In the Lupasco logic, it is real things and processes that have meaning and apply one another's existence and changes. Implication is causally efficient. The functional role of implication comes out clearly in Lupasco's theory of systems proposed in a 1962 work, Energy and Living Matter. It is devoted to the application of the Lupasco logic in essentially all areas of biology and demonstrates its explanatory power. In a theoretical appendix with the indicated title, Lupasco sets forth the axioms underlying all of his work, starting from its most fundamental principles. As I have shown elsewhere, Lupasco's concept of systems and those of his contemporary, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, the pioneer of systems thought, are entirely compatible. Lupasco's subsequent key publications describe the application of his axiom and logic to neuropsychical or psychological matter, l'énergie et la matière psychique. This too should be reread in the light of, and I will reread re it at least, in the light of the first speaker's presentation. Dr. Porges. Nicolescu has extended the application of these principles to a proposed additional level of reality, that of cyber space time, and most recently with the concept of the evolution of society addressed in his 2015 book, From Modernity to Cosmodernity. <laughs> Your slides. Lupasco as an author. Okay. As I'm recommending to you the value of Lupasco's original work, I should mention that the style of Lupasco as an author is, to say the least, 
not an easy one. It requires the uninterrupted attention of the reader. It is not infrequent to find sentences of almost a page in length containing multiply nested clauses. His writing is extremely dense with only occasional illustrative examples. In his Psychic Universe, published when Dupasco was 79, one does not see references to current work in psychiatry, for example, to the anti-psychiatry of Lang and Bateson, close in spirit to Lupasco. Lupasco's 15 books include similar passages, but all have a different emphasis. A complete understanding, for example, of Lupasco's analysis of the philosophers whom André Glucksmann has called les maîtres penseurs, Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and Marx must be sought in several different books. In his introduction to Lupasco's The Principle of Antagonism and the Logic of Energy, Nicolescu points out that once the reader gets beyond the relatively few mathematical formulas in this book, Lupasco's language and method are perfectly accessible. It exemplifies in a self-referential manner the ternary aspects of actualization, potentialization, and the included middle, which gives it the charm and privilege of incantations that are at the, that are at the same time scientific, philosophical, and poetic. The functional link of all the terms in Lupasco's arguments is, again, implication. One stage in my own understanding of Lupasco was to reject him. That is, not his basic principle of dynamic opposition, but his own rejection of it in relation to affect or affectivity. I was not alone in this. Benjamin Fondan, a contemporary of Lupasco, who died tragically at Auschwitz, has left us a devastating critique of Lupasco's concept of the withering away of affect in the world. I mentioned this aspect for completeness. Idolization of Lupasco serves no ethical or scientific purpose. As one example of an application of the Lupasco approach, which, my ho which I hope might enter into experiential practice, I take the new field of intelligence science. It has recently received attention thanks to the efforts of a group of Chinese leaders in artificial intelligence. However, in neither of these two fields does one find a satisfactory concept of what human intelligent, intelligence might be. In the second part of his thesis, Lupasco wrote about intelligence and as an example of his thought and a form of expression, I offer a my rough translation of a paragraph of this section. It uses the example of how one finds one's way when lost in a forest to describe the operation of intelligence and concludes, one is accordingly intelligent to the extent that one's different modes of conduct find richer outlets to the extent that our vital becoming, which actualizes intensity, diversity, and so on, dominates extensity and uniformity, etc. to the extent, finally, that one can traverse a greater multiplicity of regions, that is to say, where experience, the lived content of differentiations, of analyses, of facts, is the broadest. This is why intelligence cannot be taught or ordered, but is inherent to the vital complex and is more or less successful according to the, to the constitution of the living entity at the structure, biological, ethical, his, historical, etc., of his becoming. In other words, according to whether the symbiosis of soul and body, for example, the soul, as the theater of the actualization of what is evolving, of variation for itself, of indeterminate temporality, 
of subjective negation triumphs over the body inasmuch as the latter depends on an inverse becoming designated as material or of strict causality of rigorous determinism of identity or going into action. This is not sterile theory. I believe that it again can be related to Dr. Porges's approach. I am someone who is aware of the existence of transcendence as a concept which is central to the belief system of a large number, perhaps the majority of human beings. I personally am quite content with the imminent, what lies at the heart of things. Lukasko sealed the seized the dialectic relation between imminence and transcendence, each partly constituted by, as well as implying the other. My position is perhaps best expressed in the view of the 20th century philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas. Transcendence is Levinas' word for the spontaneity of responsibility for another person. Nicolescu has contributed to the advancement of Lepasco's theory through his complexification of the notion of the included middle or third. He differentiates between a logical included middle, an ontological included middle, applicable to the constructed epistemic entities of the transdisciplinary subject and object, and a hidden included middle at the heart of reality and change. In the Nicolescu view, Lupaskian T-states and a corresponding non-Boolean logic are necessary and sufficient preconditions for the existence of the transdisciplinary domains of major interest to us. As Nicolescu correctly states, the principle of dynamic opposition is not and should not be described as a thermodynamic principle. The thermodynamics of energy underlies all phenomena in opposition, but it does not characterize all of them. The Academy of Transdisciplinary Learning and Advanced Studies Uh, the charts do not follow because I did not correct them on the PowerPoint. So I'm sorry about that. I will now either go back to my other version or continue on this without the charts. The Academy of Transdisciplinary Learning and Advanced Studies, of which Nicolescu is one of the directors, publishes a transdisciplinary journal of engineering and science. As I discussed in a 2015 paper in this journal, in our different approaches to Nicolescu's concept of the hidden included third, Nicolescu looks upward toward the transcendental aspects of existence. My interpretation of Lupasco's logic, which I have called logic and reality, focuses on the imminent ones and the explication of the evolution of complex real systems, such as those involved in real cognitive processes. In quantum mechanics, the concept of hidden vari variables was proposed by David Bohm to account for indeterminacy in quantum phenomena, but I do not consider it essential. I follow Nicolescu in his concept of a hidden included middle in all human affairs that confers on them the dignity of humanity. I consider the hidden included middle as an ontological operator constituted by recursive processing of internal and external information at the highest levels of the human mind. This paper was not intended to persuade or convince you of anything. It is simply a plea for greater recognition of the work of a thinker who was one of the most 
original of his time. As I will discuss in my keynote presentation in April during the Citrans week, the examples of the operation of Lupasco's principle of dynamic opposition can be found in all standard scientific and philosophical disciplines. The picture of reality and change that develops a constant operation of a Lupaskian give and take is for me a comforting one. It enables me to feel as in the title of the poetic book by Stuart Kaufman, more at home in the universe. If I am, there is a better chance that I behave ethically. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. If you could close your screen share. I'm very pleased to see that you were able to include some of Dr. Porges's science with Lupasco and that there are in your mind as well as mine, these overlapping weaving connections to biological principles and Lupasco's logic. Uh, I would now like to invite Edward Stack, who has prepared uh, some response and questions. Um, I think Joseph, you and Edward have had already some correspondence, so here I bring you together. Thank you, Edward. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. It's, uh, nice in Paris. <clears throat> As the <clears throat> invited respondent to Joseph Brenner presentation, the force of transdisciplinarity implication, I will express myself with my own limitation. I'm not a scientist, I'm a pragmatic practitioner with a transdisciplinary practice in uh, ethnomedicine, physiotherapy, psychotherapy, management consulting and coaching, which includes intercultural experience. I've been training people and teams towards a collective performance dynamic in more than 30 countries, both Europe, uh, North America, Asia, Middle East. And I have promoted humanistic psychology and transpersonal psychology C18. Uh, I'd like to comment uh, on the spirit of big opposition, uh, uh, Dr. Brenner's presentation. Uh, I first, my first Will be, I understand the resistance that Lupasco met within the academic community in France, which is most inevitable. Uh, where we hope for innovation, once we have created it, the non invented here is al always pretty strong, strong, no matter the subject in France. It's uh, very powerful. I like very much you being a uh, debunker, Mr. Brunner calling a cat a cat as well, or your declaration on dogma, the sink or destroyer of being. Uh, I feel close to Michel Rondam, who was a very uh, focus on Japan and Garmorin that I met in 81 for a European Congress of Humanistic Psychology. Uh, both have been nourishing my thinking long ago. Um, I'd like to point something more special uh, uh, reminding Krishnamurti, who says, only the experience is bringing freedom. Uh, to go with Professor Brenner beyond the limited acceptation of implication, I would like him to expand up to the involvement process. What would be for you, uh, Joseph Brenner, the difference between implication and involvement? Would you like to answer right now? Uh Yes. I th first of all, uh, I'm glad to meet you now after mes the, the messages. Uh, the bandwidth is very bad. And I was able, luckily, to hear your question about the relation between implication and involvement. Yes. Uh, both are processes. Implication is a movement 
of the mind and involvement is another kind of movement of the mind. And I would look for their similarities rather than their differences. Uh, implication is, in my sense, is an involvement in the essence of whatever is being discussed. And this is what, why I feel that it's a, not only a fair question, but one which has this, can be expanded and of which this is just off the top of my head. If I just uh, react, my own uh, perception of involvement is uh, very close to Dr. Porges with the biological involvement, uh, including mm -hmm. especially in a risky situation, the emotional involvement, and uh, in terms of Taoist uh, uh, philosophy, it's a full involvement of all the dimension of people, uh, when people are able to. I will continue with my uh, fifth point. Uh, in the 21st century, we need to question ourselves between beyond the theoretical models, and we need also to focus on cultural resistances uh, as they are seen in various cosmogony, and also power games of key players, like you spoke of Trump in your presentation, that are in fact local realities operating far from the deep reality that we are aiming at. <laughs> uh, yes. let, me, let me introduce Manès Ferber, who was a psychologist between the two world war. And uh, he wrote the psychology of power in the 13. He was criticizing Hitler and Stalin at the time where they were partners and very powerful within the National Socialist Party and the Communist Party in Germany. And Sverber wrote in this book, the one who thinks he knows the truth is a potential tyrant. And this statement should help us to open towards diversity of cultural beliefs and traditions. To be able to have a cohabitation, a really different point of view, and with a macro logic behind that we are looking for. Uh, my sixth, yes, please. Oh, please. Can, I, can I comment on this? Well, we'd be very pleased to. Yes, well, uh, truth is a big mess in, uh, in logic also, because uh, everything is done in terms of truth, function, truth functionality, but then you are left with the nothing but the binary aspects of truth and not the essential ones. And uh, this is why the Lupasco logic needs to be characterized and accepted and used as a uh, logic that is not truth functional, that does not depend on propositions. And of course, this argument is one I have tried to make, but I have found very little support for it. Uh, any ways of emphasizing the ways to go away from the what it was almost the straitjacket of a conception of truth uh, would be in the direction of, of Lupasco's thought. I will go back to that uh, when, we, when we come to Levinas uh, later on. Uh, my sixth point uh, is your reminding of Lupasco, the link rational and irrational, identity and non-identity, link yeah. the constitutive relation of the contradictory, complementary, and the duality of dynamic terms. Uh, my, my experience is that it takes time to really perceive and embody this complex dynamic. And I recommend that uh, in the future, not only today and, uh, and Friday, uh, but in the future, we better illustrate it so more people are able to comprehend uh, this level of perception and understanding which is very demanding. Most people, especially in France, are easily agitated by intellectual thought, logic, that ultimately question their habits and their automaticity. And uh, I can tell you, living in France most of my time, um, researcher, intellectual, 
are avoiding the body involvement, uh, the connection between the mind, the consciousness, the emotions, and the energy flow in the body. So uh, it needs really to be continued. Uh, I've seen that when we share about Taoist saying Wu Wei, the non-active action, most people don't take into account the yin yang um, qualitative relation. For example, a tepid cup of tea is more yang than a cold one, and a hot cup of tea is more yin. It's not quantitative, <laughs> but qualitative. It's a permanent changing ratio. And uh, like uh, me, I'm an old man, so I'm more young and uh, more yin than a young man. And um, yeah. it's going like that. And most people are in the Western world have difficult time to understand this fluidity, flexibility of the Chinese mind. Uh, my seventh point would be, uh, if you could develop more, the very interesting principle of dynamic opposition, especially in respect to evolving human consciousness. You mentioned that, and uh, there is a need for more development uh, in your slide seven, implication of the process. Again, the logic of Lupasco, real things and processes have meaning and imply one another's existence. Implication is causally efficient. I smell a treasure, and I would like to open more the embedded Russian dolls that you show us to catch <laughs> more of this inside complexity. Would you like to add something now? Well, I would only add that there is in Lupasco's work, a discussion of the mechanism of consciousness that can be compared with more modern conceptions such as uh, the other speakers. Um, the concept is that in any case, the nervous system and nerves operate according to a kind of logic, which is the Lupasco logic. It's, it's moving from actual to potential only in the case of nerves, it's moving from passive passivization to active act, passivation to activation. And this is what Lupasco relates, him, he himself relates the, uh, his logic to the operation of nerves. And I think uh, it, here I've read that, and I have discussed it in, uh, in my book, but uh, it's perhaps interesting for you to go back to that original uh, formulation of the uh, consciousness and unconsciousness and see to what extent uh, you as experts in that field, because I'm just a, a chemist, uh, can perhaps reformulate uh, Lupasco's own conceptions of the operation of the nervous system. That would be, of course, very interesting to me. I, I will but try uh, to, if, that you would perhaps see some value will, in that. I will try to reformulate because I listened carefully to Paul Jess previously, and I go back to implication is causally efficient. In my words, I would say that if I practice Tai Chi Chuan or I lead a seminar and I am aware of my full body, all my joints, all my breath, Okay. all the time, all my emotions, and I concentrate as if I am in a dynamic meditation. And it creates an energy field. My presence impacts the presence of all the participants. I did it for 30 years, many, many times. And I don't know how to say more about that, but I seem that it's something close to the idea of implication is causally efficient. Does that make I sense? I agree. I don't think that I will, I will try to restate your idea. Uh, you cannot see the implications of uh, a complex situation if you are not involved in it. Uh, that's using implication in the common sense usage, but I think it applies also to the more formal use 
of implication as the underlying operation that gets you from actual to potential and back again. Okay, uh, I continue okay. with my eighth point. Thank you. Uh, for the cosmogony that you spoke uh, of, I tend through anthropological approach to consider them as meaningful storytelling transferred from generation to generation. And I wonder what are the real application in neuropsychical and psychological matters. I really need more arguments to understand your point. Uh, no, I, missed, I missed the first part of your statement, so okay. I cannot answer the question. I'm sorry. But when you spoke on cosmogony, and cosmogony. you said that cosmogony, and you said that there are real applications in neural psychic psychical and psychological matters, uh, I don't get the point uh, precisely. I'm sorry, I, I didn't refer to that today. Okay. I read your article so that I took it from your article, but it's not uh, very important. We can, we can, uh, we can discuss this separately. Right? Yes. I yes. would like to, I don't see the, the relation at this point. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. no problem. Uh, my ninth point will be on uh, your slide uh, 9, 10, and 11 that I will not comment, but just ask if you could define further what is human intelligence uh, to pursue the interaction, uh, to make the connection with the process of change in groups and organization uh, in daily life. I will remind the audience of the film The Seven Samurai in Japan. Uh, where a bunch of free warriors support the peasant community to defend themselves from a gang of bandits. And they both bring their fighting expertise, but also raise the level of consciousness of the peasants, inviting them to be brave and united instead of weak and lonely. <laughs> yes. And for me, the samurai play role model in this process. It seems to me a good example of shared collective interactive intelligence. I agree. Has, that's clear. It has been part of my job. Yes, that's that's an easy one. Villages. <laughs> so what, what would you define as human intelligence in terms of have a broader perspective? Oof. It's huge. <laughs> yes. Uh, Human intelligence, to define human intelligence again, um, <clears throat> it's of course a capacity. It's ultimately a capacity. It's not a, a set of point knowledge points. It's a capacity for reacting to the kinds of things we talk about here. It's because they are outside of and beyond the disciplines and, and the training in which one has been. And perhaps it needs intelligence uh, to understand them. I, that's not saying that you don't need to use an in intelligence to understand anything, but uh, Perhaps there is a transdisciplinary intelligence, I'm thinking out loud, uh, that is characterized by some more, um, I don't know, more interactive aspects. I don't know, I can't, I, I can't think of anything else at the moment. I, I might uh, try to interpret. Yes. Um, if we think to pour just, again, in terms of the biological, a form of a higher human intelligence, that is where we actually make contact with the neocortex or a more, our, our more recently evolved brain, um, vagal tone and the development of vagal tone is the essential aspect of 
um, breathing, prosody of voice, the development of the ability to perform the action of silence, receptivity, re um, reciprocity, any of the feedback loop systems require that the vagus participate so that the autonomic nervous system and the fascia, if we go back to what Margarito was developing and what Edward has studied for many years in respiration, then the capacity, as you're mentioning, Joseph, is informed but also expansive and the potential for creativity and um, the socializing connectivity that Porges is bringing is, I feel, the new forefront of the transdisciplinarity movement capacity as a worldwide investigation to begin to think and bring this gap between logic of principles and understanding of the intellectual bringing of Lupasco's work into the embodiment and practice. Um, I don't know if Margarita, if you have something you would like to add uh, to this part of the dialogue, but um, Edward, do you have another question? Um, yeah. Uh, another well, I, may I respond can, first yep, to that? Sure. sure. Then, uh, uh, do we have any questions from the chat? The, from Not the very one? many, not very many. Um, there's one. Go yeah. ahead, um, Joseph. Yes, well, I think that is a absolutely valid program. Um, the only thing I want to add to it from the point of view of this presentation, apart from the objective that you have well defined, is that Lupasco's logic itself is not static. It and needs to be developed and inputs are needed for that. It's not just a, uh, it has been to a certain extent, a stagnant body of knowledge. And uh, let's, let's certainly use as much as he has already, but A, go back to it, for example, to his discussion of the operation of the nervous system, and then of course, add to it with, with new knowledge. So uh, what I really hope for, uh, one of the things I hope for out of this Congress is a recognition that of the obligation, so to speak, to add to Lupasco for exactly the reasons that he is uh, useful in, in, in achieving That's your true. goals. It's absolutely critical. And this is why I would never have gone forward with an experiential embodied program without Lupasco. His work is absolutely essential. Um, what Edward was saying about the need for those who are visual learners, those who are experiential body people, very often the bi-directional understanding where we have both aspects working simultaneously. I believe we will be able to move in the trans. We will be able to move forward with what is required for a transdisciplinarity of being to actually manifest more and more. Okay, uh, first of all, I agree with you, but I see a question that you asked to the panelists. Please, could you explain the concept of affectivity in Lupasco's theory? Yes. And there, and I will hope for Edward's comment on this point also, we have a problem because Lupasco's theory of affectivity placed it in a 
domain of existence in which, in which it is cut off from reality, in which it's cut off from physical processes, whether they're in nerves or, or anywhere else in the body, and therefore it operates against what we are trying to do here. And uh, thus, uh, any, that's why I made a point, although it, of course very short, that one cannot idol, idealize or idolize Vipasco, but recognize that he has this very serious limitation when one is trying to use his theory as where it's absolutely needed. So this is a little bit of a problem. I think, I think we can address uh, this uh, missing point uh, with a mix of uh, modern science and uh, tradition. Uh, my son was uh, during uh, his uh, fetal life uh, receiving vibration from uh, traditional uh, songs for uh, the, the, the pregnancy from an Indian lady. And there is tradition in India to start from the the fetus life up to the massage of baby, of uh, the, the, the connection between the mother and the baby. And it's an ongoing thing that can be followed up to the dying patient with someone holding okay. his hand. It's a, it's a full life uh, experience that we need to look at. I'd like to continue on my comment. And uh, as the aim of the Congress is to advocate transdisciplinary education, I would like to share the idea that teaching behavioral ethic with cooperation is useful for major social changes. We need to impact even the politicians uh, with the coherence between the, the speech and the action. And there is a lot to do uh, in, even in democ democratic country. Uh, Part of my framework come from Asian culture with acupuncture, Buddhist, Taoist practices. In acupuncture, we to understand the flow of energy in the body that will interest Margarita with the, with the fascia, we use an agricultural image, irrigation of deserts, draining the swamps. And personally, I practice social acupuncture in enterprise where there is <laughs> too much energy stuck, uh, where there is a lack of interaction uh, with uh, emotion and trust, like Borges was speaking. Uh, we, they need the regulation with the trust and the open uh, authenticity in the connection. And, uh, you know, it's not enough with the duality of looking what works well, what works wrong. I look also, I look also at what is missing that could help, what is misused. And in France, yeah. most uh, scientists don't look at what is missing. What's good, what's wrong is the main focus. But what is missing, maybe it's the, the, the third term, the third part uh, that you were speaking of. Uh, I would like now to disagree with Lupasco on two points that I will not develop because we don't have enough time, I guess. When he said that intelligence cannot be taught, and when the soul triumphs over the body, I think those two points need to be debated by the transdisciplinary community in regard to cognitive development seen from nowadays, and also the aim of embodiment. I don't have time to go in detail, but no, maybe uh, have some uh, comments on of that. Of course. I, I quoted the passage from Lupasco in its integrity simply to, as an example, and we're not saying that we agree with everything he says, so fine, those, those points can be in fact, serve as a starting point for further debate, or they can be thrown out as irrelevant. But uh, this is what he said, and this is why I think <clears throat> to the extent that one can find links here and there, it, it's worthwhile to show that. That's, that's all. I'm not, as I said, I'm not pushing it. So I keep moving. Uh, I feel very happy with the, the saying of Levinas on transcendence, who is the spontaneity of responsibility for another person. Uh, that makes me feel human. I like it very much. Uh, I'm also very comfortable with David Bohm, 
uh, his book, um, uh, Wholeness and Implicate Order, has been translated in French by a friend of mine who was a journalist and a, a journalist from radio, radio uh, culture. And I like his notion of unfolded reality, which is illustrated, illustrated sometimes by origami Japanese folding or Chinese folding. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Joseph, for your, your lecture. And uh, I'm very happy with Kaufman uh, and your conclusion to be at home in the universe. Uh, according to the Chinese ideogram we discussed previously, uh, Wang, which is the man uh, in search of connection with earth and sky, it's the base of acupuncture system. So it's a re biological reality. <laughs> And uh, this has been my operating mode, uh, using my awareness to be conscious of my breath all day of my life for the last 50 years, observing my thoughts. Uh, and I, I wish everybody a, a very successful life journey. And I would like to challenge the TLD community as a whole to continue unveiling what are the principles as well as the, pro as the process one must engage toward embodied being? Thank you. Is this a question to me? <laughs> I, you can of course <laughs> um, share your opinion. <laughs> well, the first, the first thing is to uh, and I hope you would retain that formulation of it because it's very succinct and tells us what we need to do. I don't think I will try to answer it. I think we're running out of time, but I think that's a good way to pose the problem. That's all. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, I only have seen one or two questions in the chat, one of which Joseph has already answered. Um, and we are now, I think, close to the end of our morning hour, evening hours. Um, I invite all of you to return on Friday to hear Jennifer Gidley on the future of education and Harold Terry Lindahl, who is speaking about humanology. And Stephen Porges will return for a conversation directly with Harold Terry Lindahl on the science of being. Okay. Yeah. Well, in the name of uh, Julieta Idar, uh, I would like to close the session. But before that, I would, uh, I think uh, I can express some of her thoughts, saying that, uh, of course, I will need a lot of time to digest what uh, was brought today by Dr. Porges and Dr. Brenner. And, um, and of course, whatever they brought uh, can be discussed in future, in future sessions we'll have and uh, also the interaction between the members of the panel is in itself a most enriching exchange, which will happen uh, not only that occurred, not only here, but uh, these personal contacts will, will be made uh, as, as follows. And um, the theme embodiment of mind, uh, embodiment of being, is, is such a complex uh, theme and that has to be treated not only from an ontic, ontic perspective, <clears throat> but from an ontological perspective. And this poses a great challenge for us uh, trying to understand and enlarge our knowledge of, of what transdisciplinarity is. And also it takes time to transfer all this, whatever is posited by the speakers in our practice. And um, so there is a lot of work that follows each session. Uh, we are sorry that we did have problem with uh, uh, Aziz's uh, uh, talk, which is, was an excellent talk. 
it was impossible to show his PowerPoints, which would be most enlightening to, to, for, the, for the speakers to follow what he had posited. But we will um, upload his paper and his PowerPoint in the Congress site. And I really ask you, please take your time and see it because it's really worth it while. It will not, we had to cancel the, the recording from the YouTube transmission because or else all the, all the, the transmission would not be, uh, uh, will not be made by the YouTube, by the YouTube. Um, I think that um, um, this, the theme today um, is, demands a lot of reflection and a lot of uh, uh, more than, than reflection, uh, it, it needs our capacity to embody uh, what is already available in the transdisciplinary scenario and also to bring it to, to practice, which is the most difficult part. So, as you said, Stark, about principles and processes for embodiment, this is a big task that is there open for all of us to research, reflect, and uh, share and implement. Thank you very much, and see you on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.